Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ahkam SOS, the show on the religious rulings on Islamic duties and practices by the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi. May Allah prolong his life. I'm your host, Mustin Shah, and joining me, my co host, is Sheikh Ali Ma'ash. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Na. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. And today's topic will be on the criteria of a jurist. Sheikh Na, last time we were discussing uh, the concept of marja'iyya, taqlid, ijtihad. Uh, is taqlid wajib or not? Uh, the journey one takes to be to reach the level of ijtihad. Um, when it comes to marja'iyya itself and following a marja, we know we follow them in ahkam rules. Can we actually follow a marja in anything else? For example, a qaid, you know, a suladin, the principles of religion. Can we follow a marja in that? A'udhu billahi as-sami'a al-alim min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa alihi muhammad Let me mention one of the very first um, issue and mas'ala in which you can find in every uh, is- Islamic rule- rulings and practices of, them, of the alim the amali of every scholar that he mentions this specific um, rule. He says it is mandatory f- that a Muslim's belief in the fundamentals of religion in Usul al-Deen be based on reasoning and proof. Okay. In, in other words, we're not allowed to actually follow um, the words of others, even if he's a scholar, he's a jurisprudent, uh, spent years and years in Hawza studying, be- becoming mujtahid, um, to follow him with regard to the beliefs. Because the beliefs is to do with reason. The belief is to do with aql and intellect. intellect. So we have to ourselves prove that, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does he exist or he doesn't exist, for example, the prophethood and so forth, because we, Usul al-Din um, is divided into five sections. Mm-hmm. Number one is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ah, tawheed. tawheed. Number two is the adil, the justice of Allah, the Almighty. Number three is the prophethood mm-hmm. of all the prophets, and including the prophethood of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, so he's spoken Allah. of his pure family. And the fourth one is the Imamah, the leadership of mankind, the divinely leadership. And the fifth is the Ma'ad, Resurrection Day, the Qiyamah, and so forth. So to believe in these five main principles of religion, we must believe with reason, with evidence. And we have to justify to ourselves that, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does exist, and he sent the prophets and the religions and so forth. And to be able to bring ourselves out from the doubts to okay. the certainty. It's very important. From the shak to yaqeen. And that's why we cannot follow the alim or anybody else or even our parents to follow them. If they say to us, for example, no, Imam Ali wasn't uh, the first khalifa and imam. No, we can't. We have to use our own intellect and reason to reach that uh, stage in which we can prove to ourselves that who is the rightly guided caliph and vicegerent of, of the Prophet of Allah, peace be upon him. That's very important. So we need to go back to our intellect, to reason. And that's why we see uh, many people convert to Islam and specifically to those to convert to the uh, following Ahl Bayt they use reason and intellect and research. Mm. They just ignore their parents, be it uh, they are Christians or Jews or, 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 or non Shia followers of Ahl Bayt, for example. They would study and research and then they convert to this true path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So basically, um, what is needed in Usul al Deen. And the principles of faith and belief is to um, apply and implement our reason, our aql, to reach that stage of being able to define our true religion and belief. Ascent, Sheikh Ascent. Now, last time we discussed uh, what it takes for a marja to reach the level of ijtihad 
or individual to reach the level of ijtihad we talked about the education and academic journey that they take through Hawza what are the other criteria of an individual to become a marja I mean you know, does he even have to be a Muslim let's say if he's a Christian but he studied all the Islamic texts the Quran the hadith everything he doesn't believe in it but he can still withdraw uh, rulings from these sources can that person become a marja because he's qualified technically there are certain conditions for the one who wants to be become a marja and lead people religiously uh, certain conditions and rules I'm just going to mention them quickly um, the criteria of religious obedience of mujtahid to be able to become a leader of the people so he would be able to issue fatwa the haram and the halal and so forth number one he must be a male of course not to be a female okay. and that's uh, requires a, a specific and, and um, a special um, time to actually explain why did Islam emphasize on the male more than female on such issues in leadership for example um, so number one he must be a male number two adult so we cannot follow a child even if that child was very intellectual smart reached the stage of ishtihad um, in his the age of teens for example 12 13 still he must be uh, <coughs> so we can actually follow that person number three to be sane <coughs> and the fourth is to be free so you okay. cannot follow a slave okay. in the time of slavery of course so mm. we follow the uh, the one who is free from slavery number five to be a Muslim and the follower of the 12 Imams of Ahl al-Bayt peace be upon them very important to be a Shia of Ahl al-Bayt because we are not allowed to follow those who um, took their knowledge and their fiqh from the enemies of Ahl al-Bayt okay. so we follow those who took their um, teachings from Ahl al-Bayt so that's very important criteria number six to be legitimate birth so somebody who was born halal that's very important as well okay within wedlock number seven to be alive so we're not allowed to follow a dead person ah, but you can actually ask the permission from the alive and existent marja' to follow your previous marja' who died just okay. recently for example so you can remain on the uh, for example on following the deceased marja alim and then for the new masail and new issues you refer back to uh, the uh, alive and, and uh, existing marja so let's say ayatollah khui died before i was born can i can i follow when i reach the stage of balugh balir can i follow uh, ayatollah khui of course you can't because he he died uh, years ago so um, you have to follow somebody who's alive to st actually to start your taqlid uh -huh. from scratch from new you have to follow somebody who is alive if that alive marja died then you can remain on his um, uh, taqlid by the permission of the new marja that you can follow the, okay. the live one otherwise you, we cannot follow the dead for example uh, we're not allowed to follow um, Sheikh al-Mufid or Sheikh al tusi for example uh -huh. who died centuries ago yes okay um, the next condition is that he must be adil, a just alim, a just jurist because um, to follow somebody who commits sins and wrongdoings we cannot actually follow and trust that person he must be adil, a just person in all matters of life but surely he's fallible, he'll make mistakes he, maybe he might even sin here and there in private is that okay or no even in private? you know the sins which are um, how can I say uh, continuously he does that sin God forbid let's say somebody who every day listens to uh, music for example mm -hmm. something that is continuous always he does it so Adil is, is the one who uh, usually doesn't commit these sins you know 
these sins of one or two here, I mean, our ulama usually they avoid sins. And some of them even avoid <coughs> the makruh, the, the dislike. Mm -hmm. So the alam, when he reaches that level of piousness and ijtihad, he would, of course, uh, refrain himself even from the uh, makruh as well. Um, the next condition that he should be alam, most learned, most knowledgeable, and of course, um, it's difficult to define such alim, but in overall, the alim and the most knowledgeable, you can define him when he actually extracts and deducts the rule and the hukum from its sources uh, in a specific way, in an mm -hmm. intelligent way that others can't basically uh, do that. So you're saying basically once he's qualified and has uh, adapted and developed a skill of uh, create not really creating but by issuing uh, you know a ruling or a fatwa based on hadith and Quran and aql and ijma if necessary once they can do that very well that, that's one of the conditions yes basically having that skillfulness in um, extracting that hukum from from these sources and being able to issue that fatwa, then that's one of the criteria of being the a'lam. That the, the best and the most knowledgeable of, the, of those who can actually extract these uh, ahkam from its sources and issue it. And of course, a'lami, uh, uh, the most learned or the most knowledgeable, is not something easy to define. But the way to define it is to ask those experts, those other jurists mm -hmm. around who can actually define to you and, and, and find out by reading the, um, the books of that alim and the commentary on the, uh, the classic text of that, of other ulama, for example, and to define exactly how strong is this alim when he interprets the hadith, when he interprets uh, the verse in the Holy Quran and be able to produce for the public that fatwa and that hukum that he would say, I'm pleased with this hukum because this is what I've tried mm -hmm. my best. I, I um, made my all attempts to extract this hukum from this hadith or from this verse. Awesome. And in regards to following one marja, is it we have to follow one? Is this wajib that you have to follow one marja? Or can you follow, let's say, two or three marja? Well, you have, to look, you have to follow basically one marja, one scholar. And if that particular scholar had in some is, in, in his um, verdicts, let's say he would say ihtiyat wujubi or precautionary, in some specific fatawa or, or these uh, verdicts, you can go back to others. But you have to remain with one. You have to stick with one marja. You follow him and you take the rulings from him, you cannot actually go to others uh, randomly and, and choose whoever gives you know, easier mas'ala or, or easier mm -hmm. uh, verdict and, and hukum. No, you actually, actually stick with one of them. And in some of the mas'al, as I mentioned, which says the marja is precaution, then you can go to the, the most alam after him, the most learned after him. And for that specific rule, you can follow others with this regard. Awesome. Um, Sheikh, now we, this uh, program uh, is, is in, uh, in accompanying with the rulings and the Rasul Amliya of Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi. Now, Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi, can you tell us a little bit about how he studied, where he studied, and um, a little bit of how we are comfortable and confident that he is the marja that we should follow? Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi studied in Iraq and Iran for the past 40 years he's been studying and teaching and nurturing um, dozens of uh, students and disciples in both countries he was uh, for a few years in Kuwait as well he also taught and nurtured students in Kuwait for some time um, he wrote many books in regard to the Islamic fiqh and usul, and he became proficient in, in this field. 
And he wrote also books in ethics, politics, in um, other segments of the Sharia. Ah, and by now he has over 80 books published by the Sayyid. And he is now teaching Bahat al Kharij in, in Qom, and he has many students in, in this field. And uh, according to our experts, the ulama that we have, that he is currently the alam of and the most learned of the ulama. Ascent. Sheikhna, there, there is some uh, bad media, bad publicity around Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi. There's a lot of rumors. Can you clarify uh, that these rumors are false and how do we know that these rumors are false? For instance, the houses themselves of the other maraja, have they actually agreed and commented on Sayyid Sadiq and these rumors? Basically, the history of the Holy Prophet of Islam and his pure family proved to us that um, from the very first days of their uh, da'wah and call for Islam, for the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in religion, in um, piousness, in ethics and moral, um, they all had enemies and rumors around them in a way that the Prophet of Islam, peace upon him and his pure family, was called magician was called liar. And all those to al Ahmed of Al-Bayt as well, who are also being attacked and insulted by the enemies of Al-Bayt. So this is something uh, we have witnessed when we read the history of the Prophet and his pure family, that how the enemies and how the Satan embodied in some of the human beings mm -hmm. fought against the right path, fought against the true word, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, nowadays, we can also witness that how people attack some of the scholars, the pious scholars, the uh, knowledgeable scholars who represent Ahl al-Bayt uh, in their conduct, in their behavior, in, th in their teachings, in their writings. You won't be able to find something that is against, for example, the Sharia ah in the works of Atullah Shirazi, for example. And the best thing is for us is to go back to his books, his, his lectures, listen to it, read the books. If we can actually visit the Sayyid himself in Qom, we go and visit him, talk to him. I think that will clarify a lot of misconceptions and um, issues which were spread by the rumors. And I think. Um, we have to uh, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from um, spreading these issues because that is against the teachings of Islam, the Quran and Ahlul Bayt Also, uh, the fact that no office has openly disregarded or attacked Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi uh, and his office and his campaign and that he is not some sort of person that is um, bringing uh, a bad image towards Islam, this surely is a proof as well that uh, they support uh, and acknowledge his um, status. Of course, many of the scholars wrote acknowledgement for the piousness and the moral and the ethical aspects of the Sayyid, as well as his knowledge, his deep knowledge in Islam, in Fiqh, in Sharia. Ah. And uh, I think that's what we need. We don't want to go further, further and listen to those who have no knowledge. Because the Quran says, ask those who know. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذكر. So we try to stick with those who know. We try to listen to those who um, acknowledge those pious scholars, those individuals who served the Sharia for 40, 50 years, who sacrificed, who, um, who saw all those calamities and uh, difficulties and suppression from the tyrants, for example, the, the past regime in Iraq, for example. Um, so I think we try to stick with um, those who appreciate the scholars and appreci appreciate knowledge and ilm. And we try to avoid uh, the rumors and uh, what we hear from here and there, or what is written here and there. 
and we stick with the verse which says وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا السَّلَامَ If the ignorant said something to them, they would say salam, peace, and ignore them. That's the best uh, solution uh, for being able to go forward and continue our message and to convey it to the upcoming generation. I thank you. I thank you. To the viewers, thank you for joining us on this episode of Ahkam SOS. And if you have a question in regards to Ahkam, please send them to the contact details provided. And inshallah, the Shaykh will be addressing those questions. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.